everyone, this is Glenn Hodges, the Results Coach. Welcome to Chattanooga Self-Improvement Media, a mastermind group, where we listen, ask questions, comment, and learn in an effort to make each person the best version of themselves, thus helping to make the world a better place in which to live. We are a closely connected group of truly authentic we are an exemplary illustration of the fact that authenticity is the great connector. We're, we're very pleased to have our own member, uh, Lewis Lee, as our guest speaker today. Lewis owns L2L image, L2 Images and creates video projects for a wide variety of clients, from small museums to large medical centers. He also produced the film documentary, Outdoor Chattanooga, presenting the story of how Chattanooga went from being one of the dirtiest cities in America to being an outdoor adventure mecca, and how a small, underfunded department of, the, of city government helped make that happen. Born in New Orleans, Louisiana, Lewis is a U.S. Navy veteran and has worked many jobs, but his career has been as a journalist starting as a, in high school as the editorial page editor for the high school newspaper, as well as its photographer. Lewis went on to work at a weekly newspaper in Baton Rouge, got his degree and moved to television as a reporter photographer in the mid 1980s. That's what brought him to the Tennessee Valley in 1991. Lewis has also been a news director and anchor on local radio and edited his own online newspaper for a while. In a career of asking tough questions, Lewis learned very early that facades can't last. A person's best bet is to present themselves truthfully because the truth will always come out eventually. And while most people can overlook shortcomings and mistakes, they won't overlook deception. Lewis, it's all yours. Let's learn about being authentic. <laughs> well, good morning and thank all of you for joining into the meeting. As, as Glenn just said, I'm Lewis Lee. I'm lots of things, but for today, it's just me sharing some thoughts. Um, I was taken aback when a few weeks ago, Glenn, another friend, and I, the, the other friend being Maurice Lewis, were having lunch together, and Glenn asked me if I would uh, like to give a presentation on authenticity. I don't remember exactly how the topic came up, but he said he appreciated that I seemed to, that I was who I seemed to be, and of course, I took that as a high compliment, and one I wasn't really sure if I deserved. So in the ensuing time, I've done a lot of soul searching to test myself and see if I lived up to his appraisal. And as part of that process, I have to admit, I don't think so completely. Although I do try as best I can not to give anyone a practiced or rehearsed impression of who I am, I know from experience that once you put on an act, you have to continue it. And it can be exhausting, and ultimately it will cost you in business, in personal life, and in self-respect. The great actor Spencer Tracy said, acting is the easiest thing in the world. Just don't get caught doing it. Of course, Spencer Tracy had to hold character for as long as he was on stage or as long as it took him to film a scene, then he could go back to being himself. When any of us decides to present an image of ourselves that's more polished or in any way more pleasing to others than is true, We've taken on a lifetime scene to play. And if for one minute you forget your lines, you're caught. And speaking of acting, one of the first quotes that came to mind when Glenn asked me to speak was from Shakespeare's Hamlet, you know the one, to thine own self be true. It may sound profound. It may sound cliche. It's actually uttered by Polonius in Act 1, Scene 3. Polonius is giving his son Laertes some fatherly advice before Laertes heads off to Paris. In context, the passage goes, This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Granted, Elizabethan prose doesn't exactly translate smoothly into modern-day English, but when you break it down, 
read it slowly and swirl the words around in your noggin, they make so much sense. Above all else, be yourself and don't lie to anyone. The funny thing is, when it was written based on the meanings of self and true as they were used in England in the 1600s, most academics agree that Polonius was actually telling his son to take care of himself before he can take care of anyone else. But we'll take it at today's meaning. Earlier I said that from experience, I learned that putting on an act would always come back to haunt you. When I was younger and my dad was still alive, he told me to be a social chameleon, to be well-read, open-minded, and blend into the social environment I found myself in. And if I was in a room with educated people, I should behave a certain way, mimicking their mannerisms, speech, and the like, to fit in, making them more comfortable with me and preventing me from sticking out too much. Likewise, if I were hanging out with rec center dads after my kid's ball game, I should loosen my speech, dress the part, and talk about topics these men would consider interesting. Fishing, not fishing. And while that kept my options open and people seemed to like me, it was hard to keep straight in my head sometimes. And one time when the two worlds met, I was in the middle and it was uncomfortable. I looked like a fraud to both groups. The academics learned that I hadn't gone to college and the other dads learned that when fishing, all I accomplished was drowning worms. I had a choice to make. I could try to do damage control and keep up the facade or try to embrace both worlds in an honest way. Here comes Shakespeare ringing in my ears to thine own self be true. Well, the truth was that I did feel comfortable with multiple groups. I was well read as a youngster. I was reading the encyclopedia before I even started school, but later in life, I was bored in school and wasn't a good student. So I joined the Navy instead of going to college. On the other side of the coin, I liked working with my hands, liked sports and enjoyed relaxing at the end of the work week. I had to find a way to blend all that into one person that was acceptable to whoever I met in life. It took a while and it wasn't without false starts and aborted attempts, but I had to work harder to become a well-rounded individual, the one that I wanted to be. So I went back to college, got my degree. I hung out with neighbors and learned how to camp. I did all the things I only talked about before. I no longer had to pretend to be something I really wasn't. It took a lot of work, but I somehow made the work fun. And in the end, I'm much more comfortable with myself than I was in my 20s. And now in my 60s, I feel entitled to give a little advice here, even though most of you are old, you know, grown up people, you can make up your own choices. But my advice is to be yourself and you'll never have to worry about fitting in. It's amazing, but the world, society in general is flexible. There's room for all types of personalities, expertise and skill sets in the world, and you'll find your niche. One of the most important lessons I learned along the way was not to lie. It's common knowledge that if you don't lie, you don't have to have a great memory, and I don't have a great memory. Once you tell a lie, it's like I said earlier about forgetting a line in a play, you've been caught acting, and that can end badly. Like a 29-year marriage, it simply decays and dies after years of lies. I've been with my second wife for 12 years now. I made a decision early on that I would not lie to her. She's a wonderful person who's open and honest with me, and I wanted to be the same for her. So in order to be honest with her, I first had to be honest with myself. I could no longer do anything that I would eventually have to lie about. I became a better person. Not surprisingly, it changed my life so much for the better. My relationship with my wife is outstanding. My relationship with friends and associates is better than ever. And when I look in the mirror every morning, I see somebody I don't mind knowing. For example, in the interest of full disclosure, I wrote this this weekend. I had lots of things I wanted to say, didn't want to accidentally leave anything out. So I typed it up and I put it in a teleprompter. And that's what I'm reading right now. But that also keeps me from wandering off on a mental tangent, something I've been guilty of doing when I'm speaking to large groups. I'm even working on an autobiography. Nothing to publish, just something to leave to my kids and grandchildren so that they have an idea of why my life turned out the way it did, what I did before and after my Shakespeare moment, and how my life is better now. In fact, the original title for my book was going to be, May I Have My Mulligan, Please? 
That was because I started writing it just after my first marriage disintegrated. Well, now the title's been changed to Thank God for Mulligans. Keep the faith, be true to yourselves, and be truthful with others. You won't go wrong. Thank you. Glenn, you're, mu you're muted. Uh, hi. Yeah, thank you, Lewis. That gave us a lot to think about. A lot. And, you know, I, I think the subject of authenticity came up when we were having lunch because I would mentioned a quote of mine. Authenticity is the great connector. But I think we learned it can be the disconnector. Well, the authenticity, the, fa the failure be the to be authentic. Yes, uh, exactly. The failure to be authentic could be the disconnector. I like something that you said there of in order to, I believe you said lead others, you were basically implying you need to lead yourself first. In other words, you can't help others unless you help yourself first. Uh, well, that was what Shakespeare was trying to say through mm -hmm. Polon uh, Polonius. Yeah. Uh, uh, is that, you know, get your own house in order before you try to help others. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I'm 61 now. When I was 40, I would not have been giving this advice. Or if I had been giving this advice when I was 40, it would have been wrong. <laughs> but even at 60, you know, 20 years from now, I'm going to look back and say, boy, what a doofus that 60-year-old me was. <laughs> You know, every every 10 or so years, I look back on my life and realize that, you know, things could have been better, things could have been different, I could have done things differently. But, you know, it's all that process of growing up and growing older, and, uh, and being being okay with yourself. And like I said, nowadays, you know, my wife saved my life in so many different ways. Um, but by her being so bluntly honest with me, it forced me to do the same because I knew if I wasn't, it wasn't going to work with her. And so she kind of forced my hand into being a better person. And boy, I'm, I'm thankful for that because not only has it helped our marriage, but it has helped me in every aspect of my business and social life. Maurice, you know, I, I can't help but believe not only as you also being a, a, a guy that uh, served our country and the Navy like Lewis, uh, what, what are your thoughts about some of the comments that he made this morning? I was thinking about people who were not honest. Lewis has been a news director, so his perspective on gathering the current events and the facts are part of his, his nature. Having been a news anchor, but first a reporter for many years in Boston, I got a chance to see how truth can be not just bent, but pitched in a harmful way. And we're currently experiencing that now with America's political situation. I understand the necessity to be honest with yourself, especially as a young sailor in under very dire weather conditions when an action had to be taken in order for preservation of the safety of the other men on the ship and perhaps the ship itself. So being honest with yourself is with the moment when you are called upon to do something extraordinary. You have some training to be reactive, but the circumstances are presenting you with an opportunity to really ask yourself, can you focus well enough to accomplish this task? Because if you don't, you're dead, or you're severely injured, or the mission will not be accomplished and your shipmates will be in jeopardy. Um, part of what Lu Lewis says about being true to yourself, Nothing helps you be more true to yourself when you are not an actor and you appear on television on a regular basis. Or for you, Glenn, the people that you give advice to. So I, I want to push it back to you to talk about how have you helped people be true to themselves and ultimately to the people that they are trying to help. You're directing that to Lewis? 
<laughs> no, my friend, that was all yours. <laughs> well, you know, I the first thing that comes to mind, I, I've told many of you uh, about my early career. Uh, I, I used that to illustrate the law of attraction. I went to work for a Fortune 50 company without a resume, without asking for the job. And two weeks after I was on the job, I realized, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? Because I took it for the money. I took it for the travel. I took it for the fact I was going to work for a Fortune 50 company. Now, I hadn't set the objective of working for a Fortune 50 company, but I had said to myself, a big company. I had no idea that I was going to be plunged into a very technical environment. Uh, they said that uh, power squared. I'd say, no, cornbread R square, power round. And uh, I felt I, I was with them for 14 years. I had a, a very successful career. But I can truthfully say I never felt comfortable. I always felt inferior. I, I was ashamed to tell people I didn't have a technical degree. And as a result, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I was able to, to operate in that environment. It was always, you know, I'm not sure about that. Let's call the guy that designed that product or whatever, because I made sure that in all of the facilities that made equipment that was used by the uh, electric utilities in the United States, that I knew all of the, this was the Westinghouse Electric Corporation, I knew all of the design engineers. I knew what patents they had. I knew who to go to for an operating mechanism. I knew who to go to if we were talking about uh, SF6 puffer breakers. Uh, and I impressed my clients by the fact I could get those people on the telephone. I, I gave them the engineer's trinkets rather than my, than my, uh, uh, my customers. I gave them some, but not as much, but anyway, I've rambled a little bit, but the fact is that I wish I could go back and do it again. I would, I would have a whole lot more fun because I was always trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And I was always trying to impress someone. Well, Glenn, can I get right, right, right back and redirect uh, to Lewis about the, the authenticity of unedited film or tape? Okay. Um, unedited? Yes. Unedited is often messy and hard to understand uh, and sometimes even boring, but uh, it will give you the whole picture as it was witnessed. Um, unfortunately, uh, your local and, and national evening news doesn't have time to show you the, the total story. So you have to trust the reporter and or the producer to bring it down into a manageable um, bite size <laughs> bite size portion uh, to serve up uh, with your evening meal. And so um, that, that was one of the things that, that got me out of news and into being a documentarian is that in news, every day you shoot a 90 second documentary. That's what a news story is. You're documenting something that happened. You're telling a story. You're trying to tell all sides of the story and you're trying to be objective about it. And I just wanted to be able to give myself more time to get in more depth, more detail on any given topic because I didn't think that the evening news gave it a fair shake. Uh, granted, websites and newspapers can go as long as they need to to tell a story. But then you run into the problem of people's attention span. So you have to you have to balance giving as much information as you can about a topic so that people can make their own choices. You have to balance that with the likelihood that you're going to bore them into not hearing anything that you have to say at all. Louis, I, I can't help but 
uh, ask you a question and I, I and uh, you know you may have a, a differing opinion but I don't I don't care if it's mainstream media or if it's conservative media it seems that the the newscasters uh, and all of the on-site reporters, et cetera, are all looking for that angle where they can sensationalize something. And to the extent, do they really, do they really share the facts? Uh, what, 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 what's your thought on that? Am I off base? Uh, it's hard to tell because you don't know what's in the hearts of these people. And you weren't necessarily on the scene with them when they, when they got the interviews, when they got the B-roll, when they put the story together. So uh, it's, it's really hard to look into their hearts. You have to trust that they're going to be professional and they're going to be unbiased. But that having been said, I noticed something interesting in the way that you posed your question. You said the mainstream and the conservative media. I think you were implying that mainstream media is inherently liberal, and it's not. It's, it's really not. As a matter of fact, for most of my career, I worked in fairly conservative newsrooms. I was, I was uh, a staunch Republican for many years. Uh, my first presidential vote was for Ronald Reagan. Um, so my, what you're asking is, can we trust these people? And the, the answer is ultimately you have to make the decision to trust somebody based on past performance and verification. Number one, don't ever trust one, one source for all of your news. You have to be well-rounded. You have to listen to other points of view and you have to do it with open ears, open mind and open heart. Okay, you have to understand that not everybody on TV is trying to persuade you to think their way. Okay, there are really uh, one thing that I think is wrong with American media today. Okay, everybody wants to blame the news and it's not the news that's the problem. If you look at it, your 24 hour cable networks are 95% opinion, okay? They always have these political pundits and these experts and these, um, you know, leaders in their field that are giving opinion on what's been happening in, in the world. And what you need to do is you need to find a source like the evening news and, and then you'll get a more rounded approach because uh, a, a, a national reporter for NBC News or CBS News or ABC is not allowed their personal opinions when they're delivering their piece. You'll never hear them say, I think, only if it's a political story, okay? And, and even then, very rarely, and it's usually, usually a follow-up question, and the question is because the reporter was on the scene and heard other things that were going on that maybe didn't make it into the news story. So you have to, you have to get your news from a variety of sources and try not to take what the pundits say with too much, um, too much vim and vigor. Okay. Take it with a grain of salt that it is somebody's opinion and they're being paid for that opinion. Uh, with Corey Green, uh, I'd like to ask you to comment on people's perception of the martial arts and what they see in the movies and then the reality of the discipline. Oh, well, that's pretty simple. Whenever people watch Cobra Kai, I had a guy come in and say, can you call me Hawk? So anyways, that's a character off the show. The perception is completely different. Uh, when people come in, uh, especially if they watch a lot of TV, they think in certain ways and then they realize it's a lot different or a lot harder. When it comes to children, what the problem is with confidence with children today is that a lot of their characters, they watch superheroes, whatever, they are able to do whatever they can do on their first try. And I don't know why that this has been implanted into children's minds that they have to do it right the first time. But I meet countless people, 
especially children that come in that don't feel like they can do it and they give up already in the very beginning. So the perception is definitely different, but once you get them over that hump, they're fine and they blossom and grow, but it's just the perception of what things are before they come in. And uh, does that answer your question, Maurice? Yes, it does. You, you know, you, you mentioned a, a word that caught my attention there, perception. Perception. How does perception enter into what we're discussing today? Well, sadly enough, I, I, I have experienced perception to such a degree now that I didn't realize how powerful the perception was until I would say a few months ago. And let me give an example. My business has been in Chattanooga for 18 years. And I, my perception at, at first when I came to Chattanooga was that, wow, no one else teaches real karate. So I'm going to be, my school is going to blow up. And then three years ago, uh, I was told by you guys to stay in my lane. And I did that. Um, but what I'm getting at is that I've gone to the national championships 13 times. And if the nationals was further than four hours away, I could never get more than six people. But if it was less than four hours or four hours, whatever, Greenville, South Carolina, I could get 10. Well, they take the nationals this year. They take it from July, move to September. It's in Chicago. It's nine hours away. But because I have a new place and it appears that I'm more successful than ever, even though my success was not really changed, now I have 16 people that want to go to the nationals. But I could never get more than six. Nothing changed. People's perception of me changed. And with that, I realized that that is a very, very powerful uh, place to be. It's unfortunate, though, because the people that are really doing a good thing, um, and they might not look successful, they really are. So a lot of people need to not judge people on what they see on the outside, but what's on the inside and what they're offering. Lewis, I want to you? ask you about how film or video doesn't always tell the story, specifically when we watch defense attorneys pick apart things that we are actually watching unedited on video, all the way from Rodney King up into um, the most re recent murder. Um, being true to what you see, how easy is it to convince people that you shouldn't believe your eyes, you should believe me, what I'm telling you that you're watching? <laughs> Um, you, you, if you're comparing news coverage to uh, testimony in a courtroom, uh, it's about six of one half dozen of the other because uh, a good defense attorney is going to stretch credibility. He's going to stretch the truth as far as he can legally to make his client look innocent. Okay. Um, you shouldn't be doing that in the news. Uh, the news should be presented as it was witnessed. Um, one of the first things that I learned in college that when you, when you go to a scene, and, and this was in journalism, when you go to a scene, you get an establishing shot. You, you shoot the wide shot. And then you get, you know, consecutively tighter shots. You get focused into the real meat of the matter. Uh, that was not only a visual storytelling technique, but it was also uh, a, a, a way to get into the heart of the matter and give perspective, okay? It's that perspective that, that is so important because a lot of times if you, if you just get to the meat of the matter and, and start um, explaining one side or the other, then you take the... You, you run the risk of becoming biased. Um, so you have to show that big picture as well, and then look at, at all, the, uh, all the angles of it. Um, Glenn said something about uh, a reporter finding an angle. Uh, a lot of times that's a misnomer. Yes, they're, they're trying to find the interesting or the most important part of a story, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're slanting the story to tell it one way or the other. So you kind of have to be careful with your language there. Uh, but yeah, there, there are, there are journalists who for either convenience or out of spite or um, out of a certain agenda will, will tell a story 
differently and and will leave some things out or accentuate some things that that might not necessarily have bearing on the outcome one, once again it it's just so important for you to vet your news sources and uh, and make sure that you trust who you're listening to and and don't just listen to people who tell you things that you already think you know expand your horizons and like i said watch the news listen to the news read the news with an open mind and an open heart and understand that your your world view while it's comfortable for you may not be entirely accurate i'm looking at marcia and this uh soon to be publisher sitting right next to her <laughs> about <laughs> <laughs> about being able to trust uh, the accuracy of a few words that are designed to give you the entire story. In specific, I'm thinking about a headline and but the oh. talent of the average headline writer uh, to be able to capture the essence and in five or six words or maybe two or three. Uh, so as you get ready to write that next book, um, how important do you think it would be to authentically uh, describe the scene in just a few words? Well, actually, my head was going off in a different direction than what you're talking about. Um, because I was raised behind the scenes. My dad had his own TV show and his own radio show. And he had, um, my dad was kind of a local celebrity in Atlanta and the gospel music business. And so every Saturday night, um, it was the all night singing in downtown Atlanta in the big auditorium. My dad was the MC, And so I was backstage. And so I saw people with their stage self and then backstage, I would see them being their real selves. Mm -hmm. And some of them were so completely opposite that as um, a kid, because I would go with him on Saturday night and take my uh, sleeping bag and I would sleep back because um, it went to midnight. And uh, so I saw these people who would come out and sing about Jesus and be so sincere and then go backstage and they're drinking and slapping the ladies on the bottoms and all that. <laughs> and uh, so they had completely different personas. It was nothing authentic about it. But of course, there were some that were authentic. They were the way they were on stage, the same people were off stage. And I kind of learned the issue of authenticity from that point of view. And then um, uh, when I grew up and got married, uh, I married a filmmaker and I became a film editor. And Maurice, you and I have talked about that back when it was actually celluloid. Yeah. <laughs> you up to the light and you can see the little you know um individual frames and um and i was a documentary film uh, editor so um i learned that if you had enough footage you could make somebody say just about anything you wanted them to say and um so i'm listening to all this kind of just from a different point of view and thinking about um how authentic my dad was and the things that now he had his on stage persona he was warren roberts you know and when he would meet somebody it was hi i'm warren roberts and there was this but at the core he was the same person that he presented to the audience uh and that as he was at home and um so the issue of authenticity uh to me is a it's a very complex issue because you can, as Glenn was talking about, he felt uncomfortable being one way to one group of people and, and had to find that the balance. But my dad, he certainly had that stage presence that like and my dad was an actor essentially. But underneath the core of who he was, was the same. And, you know, Maurice, when I found out that you uh, had spent so much of your life in front of the camera, in front of the television camera, 
I was pretty amazed that you didn't have that slickness when you were around, you know, people in general. Because my dad, when he was in public, there was a slickness about him that he presented. And I would appreciate if you'd talk about that a little bit. Well, I think as our guest speaker pointed out earlier, you can put a pink tutu on an elephant, but it's still an elephant with a pink tutu on. <laughs> and uh, being in front of the camera is one thing, but being a, the best reporter and the best anchor in a town, um, I came up through the Westinghouse School of Broadcasting. And part of what we were trained to do and our responsibility, don't sit behind the desk and talk about what happened. You need to get out into the community to feel it, to touch it, to understand and let people see you. If you want to be trusted, it can't just be your written words uh, that you're expecting them to concentrate on. They know that Maurice Lewis was at our school 15, 20, 30, 40 years later. I've had people come up to say, what you said, no, here's how it starts. Hey, it's me, Cindy. Don't you remember me? You t you taught my you came up and you appeared before my sixth grade class, and I'm thinking, but you're fifty now. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't really remember. And part of the, uh, being authentic is to admit I don't remember you, or is there something that you can help me remember that will take me to that place? But being out, in, you know, uh, right now there is um, a contest for who is the best dry cleaner, who's the best lawyer, that's stuff that's in the paper, and who's the best TV anchor and what have you. Well, in my opinion is, who do you see in the community when they're not covering a story? Who do you, who do you see? And the difference between public affairs, public relations, and advertising, a vast difference. And Lewis, I'd like for you to kind of like jump in here because you've been asked to uh, uh, shoot a documentary. You've been asked to shoot a how-to, but you also know people out there that shoot commercials. What's the difference? Well, the commercial is you're trying to definitely persuade someone to buy something or to think a certain way, and and that is unapologetically biased, whereas a documentary is supposed to be completely unbiased. It's supposed to be a document of what happened. That's where the word comes from, documentary. It's It's supposed to be verbatim what happened, or at least as close as you can get. I'm sure Marsha understands that. If your husband was a documentary filmmaker, you have to go through great pains to make sure that you present everything that's germane to a story without unduly embarrassing anyone. Um, there have been a lot of times where I've been on site and been getting footage for a documentary something embarrassing happens. Um, for example, a prime example is uh, when I was uh, with Channel 12, I had followed the first of the 181st, which is a National Guard unit here in Chattanooga. I had followed them down to Camp Shelby, Mississippi for their one week of uh, annual training. And these guys are, are, you know, what we call in the middle military cannon cockers. They're, they're, they're cannoneers, they're armory. So, um, we were there and, uh, this was in the middle of the Gulf. Well, yes, it was in the Gulf war and, uh, I was shooting and they had a gas drill and a gas drill is when they yell gas, 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 and everybody has to don their gas masks, but still do their job. Okay. So now they've got their gas masks on and they're all running around trying to continue doing their job, which is, you know, re-aiming the weapon, loading the weapon, firing the weapon. Well, there was somebody that was on, this, this is a big self-propelled howitzer, and somebody was on the weapon and he made a wrong turn wearing that gas mask, didn't have 
good vision and fell off. Boom. Hit the ground like a like a sack of potatoes. Immediately, everybody starts rushing. They get a medic over there. I'm rolling the whole time. And I'm thinking, this could be embarrassing for this guy. But I've got to keep documenting it because you don't know how it's going to turn out. Turns out, later on in the day, during the, debr during the debrief, the captain of the unit use that as an example of why you have to have such extra care when you're in your mop gear military operation personal protection when you're in your mop gear you have to be extra aware of where you are so he was using it as a teaching point and that was really important to the story that i was trying to tell so even though falling off of a gun was probably a little embarrassing to that soldier it was important to continue to show that in context with the chiding that they got at the end during the debrief about how important it is to to be careful so you you have to you have to be very careful and make sure that you tell the story as completely as you can and if if there if there's something in there that might be a little embarrassing you can try to mitigate it uh or at, at least you you have to show why you included that, okay? Uh, documentaries aren't just to be mean. Uh, they're to show truth and to teach. So, you know, it's sad. One of my uh, favorite stories of the expression, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the case of Rodney King. Um, as you watch blow after blow after blow after blow after blow rain down on that man and and the cops kept saying stop moving it, that was their point of view their perspective his perspective is i want to get away from all these blows so their motivation was we got to stop him from moving his motivation was i need to get away from being a hit. So we watched as that turned out and how it split the country down the middle, just like current events, when we watched the mob breach the White House. What did you see? Like one guy said, it was just, you know, uh, tourists, I, th I think is, is the word that he, that he said. So I think it's important to refocus on what you said People need to have information, not just news, but information from more than one source. And then there is always the consideration, what is this source? The challenge that Fox should not call itself news. That's one opinion. Other people say Fox is the only news. So it's all about perspect perspective. And then it's about what are your expectations because somebody is saying something that fits the way that you think. And if they don't fit the way that you think, then they are conservative news <laughs> or liberal news, or I don't know what they are. Well, yeah, I, I, I think you hit a great point there. And one of the <clears throat> things that I diligently try to do is I, I channel surf. Uh, I go through all the networks uh, because it's just like, with my friends. I like to have an associate with a variety of people. That's the way I learn. Uh, maybe I don't agree with everyone. We may have different opinions, but we respect each other. And uh, you mentioned the thing with the military and the accident, and I, I got to thinking, my goodness, now if that had not been the military and that had been the workplace, we would be looking at litigation and we talked about attorneys a while ago. So with that in mind, Kelly, if you're still with us, uh, how does authenticity tie in with the legal profession where oftentimes they're trying to persuade a jury? You're muted. That is uh, so much out of my lane as a trainer, but I will say something that I'm seeing a trend in that I love is that people are willing to bring a little bit more of their whole self to the workplace. And I'm curious to see how that impacts 
things like courtrooms, how it impacts client relations. It's just something that's a trend I've noticed overall for the last few years. And I kind of love it. I talk about how my generation, I'm in my 50s, we came up at shields up, polish on, never let them see you sweat. And I'm seeing a little bit more where people are still being professional, but they're also revealing their humanity. And personally, I believe when they do that, it really builds better connection and people recognize they are not alone. So uh, that was a diversion from your original question because I just don't want to speak out of school, but I am seeing that. And I think that is, it's been pretty refreshing. But Kelly, you hit, you hit a great point right there. When you look at this young tennis player who said, because of the media's actions coming after their story, I will no longer give interviews because it is affecting my mental health. Mm. And in that admission, that opened up a whole new world of discussion and uh, revelation for us. Interesting. Interesting. Rick, uh, as being a creative guy, what, what, what do you, what are your comments about some of the things that have been shared? Well, I kind of have an interesting perspective. A good friend of mine is a fellow named Chris Turner. He was head of the international desk at CNN for 20 years. And his dad actually started CNN, Ed Turner. Uh, there's a movie about the Iraq war that uh, he's mentioned in, but uh, most people don't know the guy that starts stuff. But uh, he got on Ted Turner's staff because that he had been with the other networks and they didn't want to do 24 hour news. Ted Turner being a, a maverick that he was or is, he uh, 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 was willing to start this out. And the whole idea was that you could really get in-depth stories when you have 24 hours to do it. But here's the thing, I've had this argument with Chris that where the media cross the line, and we're talking about authenticity here, is when they cross the line and start advertising that they're the most trusted name in the news, <laughs> that's when they start crossing the line. Because like you say, and having this conversation with Chris sometimes kind of heated, <laughs> I always like playing devil's advocate. So, we were talking about something, I don't even know what it was, but I, I kept pushing him into how come you don't tell the whole story? And he said, well, you know, what it really comes down to is we're trying to sell commercials. Uh, it, it's a business like any other business, and we're just trying to, you know, we got to stay in business. And I thought, well, boy, that, that tells you something. And I think here's my perspective on any media is every individual is their own media. We're, we got a media right here in our heads and we believe junk and we also uh, get defensive on our own point of view. And my personal thing is I don't like to be, if, it, if something needs defending, it's not, it, it needs fixing. And so uh, that's something you haven't brought up. I mean, what our values, we, we want to defend or, you know, maintain our values and, and consequently, that's usually because that's our entire perspective. So that's the perspective we're going to come from. So one of the key things, like you say, look at more places to get your media. Chris said that, but I said, okay, that's fine. That's good. I think it's a great idea. But when you start telling people that you're the you're the best source, then you better be the best source. Well, and, and the other part of that you is know, you're telling people that you are the best source. What is your point of reference? How what did you take into consideration to be able to make that claim? If it's the result of a poll, that's the other part of the story. Yeah. Um, what, what you're seeing though is more a symptom of the problem, not the problem. Yeah. Yeah, news departments have to make money to keep, to stay on the air. But the thing is, is you can, you can sell ads by being completely unbiased. If you have a respected product that people will watch and trust, then the advertisers will come to you. The problem ran into when CNN uh, started branching off and then they had headline news and you talk about authenticity. 
TV networks are very have a real problem with authenticity because you've got MTV that no longer shows music television. You've got Discovery Networks, uh, one of them, uh, the Learning Channel. What have you learned on there besides, you know, putting subtitles under a Southern girl when she talks? How insulting is that? And, you know, you've got uh, the History Channel, which is all about ice road truckers. Now, that's not history. You got to dance with the one that brung you, okay? And that's when you start losing. But they started realizing, CNN and Fox, they started realizing pandering is also a way to make money, okay? You don't see my pillow advertising on CNN, and you don't see the Gay and Lesbian Alliance advertising on Fox. You've got base camps here, and they're pandering to a particular demographic. And what you've got to do is you've got to find who is left standing that is not obliged to a particular political ideology. And that's the one you watch right now. That's hard to find. Okay. Well, the closest 1980s, you can come is. In the 1980s, um, Lewis, I remember watching what happened to us in Boston. This is where the sales department really made an in. Uh, uh, a breakthrough into the news department. Here's how they did it. They came out and gave us coffee cups that had a product on it. And we were to leave these coffee cups on the set as we would do the news. Product placement. As reporters, we said, uh-uh, to imply that I like or drink or use this product is dishonest. They said, well, it's just a cup. You'll have to leave it there. So there are those pressures and you see it also in the movies where a huge amount of money is paid in order for that car to be a Ford or for that drink to be whatever it is. But having more than one source to look at really gives you an opportunity to develop your point of view because you may start out one way, but after you take all of the ingredients and you realize I'm making sausage, but you need, you can't just make sausage with, without the spices and without the meats and what have you. So having everything that you can mix together allows you to come out with a product uh, that is more honest. When I was at channel 12, it was a standing rule. Salespeople were not allowed in the newsroom at all. Right. You couldn't even use it as a cut through to get to the parking lot. They were, uh, they were persona non grata. They were not allowed in the newsroom. And it was like that until I left in 2006. In, I don't know what Boston, it's like today. In but, Boston, um, uh, it was a derogatory term. There was news and then there were the weasels. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, we felt that the, the sales department would, well, that's what they do. They sell, but to have to a, jeopardize the credibility of your reporters by any affiliation with a product was a no-no. Right. Well, you know, and, and you're always going to have some crossover. Well, you should. Yeah. Okay. You shouldn't period. Um, for example, three plus you on channel three here locally, it's a one hour program, but it's entirely advertiser based. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are, segments that they're not calling it news they're guest segments but the guest segments are paid for by the people who are coming on the air uh at first they were using news personnel to host this show and then they finally got away from that so now that show has its own hosting staff and it's separate from the news department they use the same facilities but at least now it's separate and in the interest of full disclosure, they will say, you know, uh, for example, if, if they do a, a live remote uh, interview with somebody about all the, the best products for a certain, you know, if you're going out to the beach this summer, the, you know, talking about the, the umbrella, the sunglasses, the sunscreen. And then at the end of that segment, they will say, and we have to say that this, uh, this segment was sponsored by Coppertone or whatever. So they do have that now so the at first it was blurred but now they've come clean and they've separated the two no news personnel 
full disclosure on who pays for what segments, and then the news is clear after that. So to 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 get back to the product placement of the 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 mug on the news desk, that would never fly in any of the newsrooms that I've ever worked in. So when when was that? How far back was that? Late seventies. Okay. Okay. You see, and late 70s, 1980 is when CNN came on and news departments started feeling a lot of pressure for com from competition. So uh, a lot of them started trying new things and different things. And a lot of times it didn't work out and it, and it hurt their reputation, hurt their credibility. Glenn, can I inject for just one quick minute sure. or something? Uh, Military is a lot different from civilian life. Uh, it's much more cut and dried. If it doesn't fit in this bag that we gave you, you don't need it. I remember I was in Kanitra, Morocco, stationed there, and I got in trouble. Uh, we had had a luau. We kind of worked it out so that the Air Force in Spain sent us a pig and we sent them a small radio tower. That's the way things work. Uh, so we're out on the beach and partying and what have you. So um, I went back to the barracks, I showered and woke up and I'm thinking to myself, man, sperms. So it kept on burning. Later on, I thought to myself, I don't feel like doing my, I was doing a radio show. I don't really feel like doing it. So I went on the other side of the barracks and I talked to the corpsman. I said, you know, like, man, something is wrong here. And they said, you've got sunburn. And I said, what is that? <laughs> so I had no perspective, but I found out real quick in the military, if you are too burned to work, that is considered willful destruction of government property. And you can be court-martialed. I mean, nobody in my family or in my neighborhood had ever said the <laughs> word sunburn. So I had no perspective of it. I had no reality of it. But I did know what, what a court-martial was. And <laughs> that was very real. So it, it all goes back to, you know, what have you done in your life and where would you like to go? And if you believe in the Bible, it's really simple going through life. There's only 10 things that you should or shouldn't do. Ten Commandments. Trip Sawyer, uh, an authentic uh, IT man. Are, are you where you could unmute? Maybe you have a little to share today. Uh, maybe not. What about Aram, he, who failed to arrive early and serve our breakfast this morning? Hi, folks. Uh, hey, Aram. Sorry, uh, I woke up to no water here, so I was trying to you know, get in contact with the Tennessee uh, American water to get my water here at home. And I just got back last night, so I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> Uh, Why don't you tell everybody where you were? Uh, I first went to my grandson's graduation in Orlando, uh, but we stopped in Gainesville. Uh, long story, but we <laughs> we were shown some houses there. We were planning just to uh, check out the, the market there. We saw one that we liked. We put an offer and it got accepted. Uh, and oh, well, Billy's not on the, the view here, but uh, I've been talking to Billy Weathers about selling our house and uh, called him and he put it on the market and we've already accepted an offer. But from the graduation in Orlando, the next day we went to Puerto Rico for 10 days uh, and had a great time. I, I don't know if you can see here. I got a little bit of sunburn, but and uh, well, we're we're looking forward to you joining us virtually after you relocate. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, and what what are your thoughts on on our subject of authenticity today? 
Well, sadly, I missed the presentation because I got on, uh, you know, by the time I got a hold of uh, American uh, Water, uh, you, know, the, you were already in the discussion phase. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's, we're sort of raised to, uh, not always be authentic uh, and to, you know, sort of, um, you know, tell other people uh, not what you really think or feel. Uh, Go along to get along. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, someone asks you, how are you doing? And you can be having the worst day and you say, oh, I'm doing great, you know. Uh, or, you know, especially men, right? You, you fall down, you get hurt and, you know, you don't cry. Uh, you know, you teach your, your boys, you know, you don't cry, you know, men don't cry. Uh, and I, I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, th I think it's it's something we should strive for, uh, just to be more authentic, uh, both to ourselves and then with others. So, Corey, you had uh, and touched on perception, and you talked about how your company was perceived differently uh, after COVID with. You had already rented a new facility, uh, much nicer, much, much larger than before. But, and they began to perceive you differently, but did you begin to perceive yourself differently? Okay. Um, I don't, I don't think so, Glenn, because people, you know, if they see something that's really nice, they, they want that maybe a Lamborghini or whatever, or a nice house or whatever it's people are, they, 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 they see those things and they, they wonder how did someone get there? So when new people come into my facility, they go, okay, this is the dojo. And then sometimes they get excited. The old people that come into the place are like, wow, this place is great. So it's just, they see the before and after, but new people just see the after. So people coming into this world, like right now, in 20, 30 years, how are they going to perceive the world? You know, talking about authenticity in the media is like talking about military intelligence. It's an oxymoron. And whenever, um, let me just say this, my perception of the news completely changed after 9-11. So what I did was I spent the past 20 years discerning between the news stations to figure out which one was telling me the truth and which one was lying. What I started finding out was they all lie. <laughs> And the reason why I say that is because you can find this on the internet. You can go and look up and see that things are scripted. How is it possible that 500 to 1,000 different television stations are saying the same thing to people? Like they'll have this script and they'll say, da 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 And then they, if you watch, you can see the newscast here, newscast here, newscast here, all around the country is saying the same thing. How is it possible? Someone's telling them to say those things. Someone is deciding what goes into the news and what doesn't. Okay, and I, don't I can that, explain that, that after you're done. Well, sure the thing is, is that you have to decide what's important, um, what, what, what's needed to be reported on. Um, but at the same time, I think other things that are important are also being left out. You know, if we keep preaching negative, 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 what are you going to expect to get out of that? Why not talk about more of the positive, positive, positive? Because that can change the mindset of the people when they're like, for example, Mr. Rogers, he went in front of the committee to just talk about the benefits of the show of him and kids and how they should be. But now you have um, drag time story hour. You know, the power has been given to sometimes, I think, the wrong people, if you know what I'm saying. So I have a lot of perspective on news and media because I've been interviewed a lot. And I can honestly tell you that not every news station or story that's ever been out there has been completely truthful because they don't actually listen to everything you have to say. And they twist your words or add words or take out things. And it gives a different perception of the person altogether. A documentary 
documents. And that is what needs to really be done is tell the news and not any opinion, even if it's not political. So it, there's, a, there's a big mess right now. And um, I'm just going to be quiet and here we have to say loose. Well, as far as the all scripts being the same, that happens a lot. Number one, uh, most, uh, most stations subscribe to a news service, whether it be Reuters or AP, Associated Press. And sometimes they'll just, out of laziness, just use the script as is, as it came down the wire. Remember, we, we all have wire services, too. Uh, but to go one step beyond that, then you've got media conglomerates, okay? You've got Sinclair Broadcasting, which owns more local TV stations than any other company. Right. Okay. Now, I used to work for Channel 12, and for a while, Channel 12 was owned by Media General. Media General was based out of Tampa, Florida, and owned, I think at the time, 20-something TV stations around the country. And people in the 80s and 90s thought that was, that was big. That was too big to be fair, okay? But the thing is, is we would occasionally get some pieces from Media General Corporate to use if we wanted to, okay? from another market. We were, we were market sharing and, you know, somebody in our North Carolina market did a story that might be of interest to the Chattanooga market. So they would offer it to us and we had the opportunity to run it. But the problem with Sinclair is Sinclair has this editorial segment that they require all their stations to run. And that right. that's, that's where it's wrong. And the FCC has failed us because the FCC has been allowing these media conglomerates to gather up and gobble up more and more local stations. It used to be that you could really trust your local station to be impartial, but now so many of these stations are owned by many networks. It's not you know, that you're a CBS affiliate or you're an NBC affiliate. No, you're owned by Sinclair or you're owned by Tribune or you know, one of these other large companies. And they are not manipulating, but they're certainly pushing a certain agenda. I, I and, understand that. But the thing is, I have personal experience with CNN News. Okay. Well, yeah, and, and, and I'm, and not, my, I'm not my, doubting my, your personal experience. No, no, no. I'm just saying that, um, I mean, there's more than just the CNN thing. I haven't, I'm just not going to get into it right now today because it's, we can talk off camera if you want after this recording is done. But... You know, I personally have experienced things that I think that should be out there and it's important and it's relevant and it helps people. And I just I am sickened by the fact that the news stations don't focus on those positive stories, because if you really want to change people, you got to use the media, the news to educate people. And I just don't think that's happening. I think it's oh. all it's all, um, you know, appealing oh. to. There are, a couple of, there are a couple of things that are at, at play when you, when, you, when you go down that. Because of cost, networks are now sharing pool coverage. One network may shoot something and then it is for use or sale to the other three, which is how you come up with the same lead story on all three networks, for instance. Secondly, your news executives make the final decision of placement for stories. They don't talk to each other between the, between the three networks. They have an evaluative process that they use. What is the story that affects the largest number of people where there's the greatest amount of interest? What is most different about what happened today that we can talk about? That's how you wind up with the same lead stories. Sec and the A section of all the news is going to be basically the same. B section is going to be much more flexible. So understanding, you know, how the sausage is made is really important, you know, to, to understand why the end product looks like it does. Now, to your point, the end of the news sections, that's where you find the positive stories, the things right. that make people happy, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The surveys and the, the things were done about running an all positive, uh, all positive network. It did not work. 
Happy news no. does not give you a complete picture of what's happening in the world. So the things that will affect the largest number of people are going to get the most attention. And I mean, there's one other thing that I wanted to interject here. And you had said, you know, watch the news, but, you know, I can read the Internet. I, I'm, I'm sincerely hoping you don't believe everything that you read on the Internet. No. Because these blogs, vlogs are completely unvetted. And people right. can say whatever. Right. They, there are people that say the earth is flat. And there are people who follow these people. That is crazy. NASA checked right. this round. Okay. But the thing is you have to be diligent don't just and, and like I, I can't emphasize this enough don't just go with the news sources that agree with your preconceived notions you have to look at the other side and with an open mind and say is there any truth to this how right. does this mesh with what i believe okay hey i i have been exhausted trying to get to the root of a simple story but it was worth it in the end okay um along the lines of what uh, maurice was saying as far as i can remember there is a good reason that the, the old expression if it bleeds it leaves it leaves, it leaves right <laughs> of course that sounds good yeah and hey. as far as as far as reserving the good news stories for the end uh, one of my favorite journalists, and, and he wasn't really a journalist so much as he was an, an, uh, a celebrity, was uh, um, Robert. Uh, oh, man. And it just completely went out of my brain. Um, but Paul Harvey mm -hmm. used to say at the end of his newscast, now wash your ears yeah. out with this. Yeah. And then he would give you a, a good, feel-good story. Um, right. So I, I think that was his way of tempering the – the serious nature of the news with, but I don't want it to ruin your day. Here's something good. I, I get that completely, came, but. Charles Corral came on. Corral said, the redheaded woodpecker is out and about in Raleigh, North Carolina today. <laughs> to you, this may not be news, but to an earthworm, this is a bulletin. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we've got a, a visitor with us today, Mr. Smith. Uh, I, I know you joined us a little bit late. Uh, would you, have you heard enough that you, maybe you would like to make a comment or ask a question? Uh, maybe. Okay. Uh, folks, it's about 923. Uh, I was, had a thought as oh. we were... Yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks. Okay. Um, just, yeah, I'm just listening in, and um, I'm just absorbing all the information you guys are talking about, and I really agree with the um the lack of um authenticity in today's uh today's media and how we perceive the media, and the information that they give out to the public is is you know it's overwhelming sometimes. Like I always say to like my younger um siblings, don't believe everything you hear, and then is it's hard for them to make a decision because they're flooded with too much information. So like right. this generation is flooded with too much information and it gets to the point where they can't really make good sound decisions because you have too many people telling them different things and a lot of the things they tell them is incorrect. Where, where are you located? I'm, I'm in uh, Georgia. I'm in um, Kennesaw, Georgia. Kennesaw, Georgia. Huh? Glad he's, he's one of my colleagues. Oh, okay. Oh, wonderful. Well, thanks for inviting him. Uh, hope you can join us again. We'll uh, we do it every every other week. Uh, I uh, had a thought that was entering my mind as we were talking about, uh, you know, how, how we think, our thoughts, or who we are. Uh, would tie right in with one of my favorite books by James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. Uh, don't you think that James Allen, for those of you that are familiar with it, are really promoted authenticity and integrity? I think that, not to get into my uh, presentation in two weeks, but all these problems have to do with the end, it comes down to the individual. These are traits that you can literally put inside your head. That's the type of things that go on. You, 
you believe certain things, you don't like other things. And so it's a, it's a, authenticity has to come from the individual and, and you know, the media will, will follow or whatever will follow. I mean, I know the building business. I've been doing architectural stuff for a, a long time. And uh, the, uh, what I've seen with housing, uh, you, you, I, I disagree with the way houses are being built. Let me put it that way. And the only way I can tell, what, the, the new builders don't know any different. So this is where one of my favorite passions is history. When you want to have different points of view and something from it, 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 history will always tell you what's going on. And that's when I, if you relate to the so-called problems, if, they, if you want to call it that, that the world is going through right now, it's done this before. And the way to deal with it is to realize how it was dealt with before and how to guide it. And that's also true about with inside yourself. So it, it's compiled, you can't have too much information. It's confusing sometimes, but that's what helps you make the right decision. The more Mr. you have- Smith, yeah. and, Mr. Uh, Smith made a good point uh, when he said that there, going back to your point, there's so much information you really need to have a, a broad perspective, but not be overloaded because it's not all news, it's opinion, it's blogs and other things. So uh, Mr. Smith, thank you for bringing, bringing that up. And Rick, this is right on target with what you're saying. Yeah, it's well, important to uh, have as much information as possible and that's it just gives you more perspective, gives you more options because we have, everything comes down. Okay, what are you going to do in five minutes? What are you going to do tomorrow? What are you going to do the next life? You know, it's you have to be able to decide by what you have previous. The history is what focuses right now. This is what you are. That's the total of what you have. The more you learn, you add to that, and that helps you into the future. I mean, that's a, that's a, just a common thing, and so. These problems are talking about the media. Media is just media is the media. It's been that way. I can tell you stories. I, I've studied odd angles of history. If there's so much, say, uh, for instance, the Egyptian history. There's a lot of information there because of the weather that have saved the papyruses that they wrote things on, right down to uh, notes of what are you going to buy at the grocery store, to bill of laden, but also news reports. And they have police reports from this one little village in, in Egypt and the same stuff was going on. And the military people were saying, oh, we can't let the media know what we're gonna do because they'll, they'll tell the people on the other side about some plan of attack we have or something. It's, it's been around exactly the same for thousands of years. So oh. it helps keep from getting upset about it when you know, okay, it's happened, we've survived. How do we do that? Well, a good lead in to mentioning our subject for our next mastermind in which Rick will be our speaker. Knowledge is a different point of view. That, that should make for a great discussion. Uh, Crystal, we want to uh, give you credit for having the most guests today. And uh, thank you. Uh, and uh it's 929. Does anyone else have a burning desire to make one more comment? I want to thank our speaker, Lewis yeah. Lee, today uh, for leading, kicking off this. Well, I'm not there, am I? Am I yeah. on? Yeah, yeah you're on. on. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I wanted to thank Lewis for getting us all moving and thinking about our various points of view <laughs> shameless plug accepted yes absolutely yes uh, but, you know i mean if 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 i leave you with anything though i mean i know we got off on a tangent with the media but i was talking about being authentic with yourself and that is just live your life to where you don't have to lie about things just be yourself and that ties right in with one of the things Coach Dan always talks about, uh, your core values. 
And I, I think maybe that would be something for all of us to think of. What are your core values? Uh, thank you again, Louis Lee. It's turned down to be a, just, a, I think, a really good mastermind. And uh, thank you for everyone jumping in and uh, invite friends because I, I, Rick's going to have a, a great subject, I think, for our next meeting. It's, <laughs> it's going to be good. Well, put downhill from there. Uh, no. all right. Well, folks, our time is running out. I, I love each and every one of you. I care about you. And remember, your day will be just as good as you visualize it. If you want to stick around for a second, we'll end the recording and it'll be kind of like uh, going up and meeting the speaker after a live event.